If you have your Bible, I encourage you to open it to 1 John chapter 4, and we'll get there in just a second. Um, but today, I, I want to share with you a simple message. Uh, it's, a, it's a message that you've, you've heard. It's a message that you're familiar with, but it's a message that is worth repeating over and over and over. It's a powerful message, and it's something that we need to never forget or never even lose focus of. And I pray that today is a message that applies to you and hits you on several different levels. To tell you, to, 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 to get into this scripture, I would like to tell you a story. And to tell you that story, I would like to introduce you to a young man. This young man's name is Ralph Berkeley Westbrook. Right? It's him on the screen. Not the best picture, right? If you want to see it better later, come see me. I'll show you on the iPad. Ralph Westbrook was one of three Westbrook sons. And if God handed out words to a family, and those words had to be um, uh, distributed between all the members of the family, one brother, George, would have received about 95% of the words allotted to these three brothers. Ralph would have got 4%, and then the other brother, Harold, he got 1%. George would talk to you about anything and everything. Grandpa, Ralph, would talk to you about stuff that's more important. George, he ain't going to talk to you. But even by chatty standards, right, these three brothers were very quiet, very reserved. But Ralph was a wise man. I don't know if you remember, if you're old enough to remember the old E.F. Hutton commercials. When E.F. Hutton talks, you might want to listen. Ralph didn't talk very often, but if he opened his mouth, you might want to just pay attention to what he's saying because it was going to be worth listening to. He was a hard worker. I, my aunt shared a, a letter with me from one employee to an uh, employer to another uh, as he was moving positions and just high praise given to him. Like to the fact, to the point that, you know what? It's going to be tough for our company to continue working, and you're getting a huge asset for your company. He was a hard worker, he was a wise man, and he was a quiet man. One day, Ralph Westbrook met a young lady named Betty Lee Montgomery. Um, And if there are more polar opposites on this planet, I would like to see them, um, because where Ralph was very quiet and very reserved, Betty was not. Where Ralph's family was, for the most part, very quiet and very private, the Montgomery family reunions were very awkward. One, because they talked about everything. They talked about stuff that they agreed about, and on a higher level, decibel level, they talked about things that they disagreed about. And this family was affectionate uncomfortably affectionate. Because anytime you would go to a family reunion or anytime where you would see the great aunts, Sheila or Lucy or Peggy or Connie, you better watch out because CW, they're going to grab you by the ears and they're going to pull you in for a kiss. And the reason that they pull you in by the ears is that so you can't do this to avoid the smack on mouth-to-mouth kiss uh, from one of the great aunts. It was uncomfortable, but it was, and it was the complete opposite of the Westbrook family. They would, I, I would love to be able to go back in time, Angie, and see the first time that Ralph met the Montgomery family. Betty must have been something amazing for him to meet the family and stick around, because it, it had to have made him uncomfortable. But these two got married. Uh, they, they got married in 1948 and spent 64 years together before Ralph passed away in 2012. Now, when I look and I think of Betty and Ralph Westbrook, this is the picture that I will always go to. This couple, uh, uh, this grandma and grandpa, uh, who were the, one of the most godly couples ever put on this planet. Grandpa was an elder in the church for as long as I can remember, and Grandma uh, was his faithful companion uh, through, through six decades. And this family grew. They had five kids of their own, and they all married, and then they had 18 grandkids. Uh, they had 28 or 29 great-grandkids, 
and they had one great-grandchild. 28-ish years ago, this is what the family looked like. This was taken at Shelby and I's uh, uh, wedding uh, many years ago, and has only, only blossomed since then. For Christmas time, we have to use a facility the size of this room just so that we can all be in the same room uh, for Christmas dinner. This family grew. But I don't tell you that story just because I'm proud of my grandparents. I tell you this story because it is a good picture of what true love looks like. Perfect love, no, because uh, human man, human woman, broken world, not perfect but of what true love looked like. You see, because three things that I want us to hold on to today about what true love is, right? One is that true love initiates. True love starts things, and that's what Ralph did with Betty. He saw somebody, and the story that I got is that he had somebody set up a blind date so that the two of them could spend some time together. He initiated that relationship. True love also sacrifices, Ralph sacrificed all throughout their marriage together. He was a very smart man, a very hard worker. He could have made a lot of money, but he sacrificed money so that he didn't have to sacrifice being home in the evenings with his family. Now, you might be able to figure this out uh, from from the, the, the two descriptions of these two, um, but, but grandma was the disciplinarian. She was a type of disciplinarian where you had to go out and cut your own switch. And if it broke, you had to go cut another switch. Right? Uh, and and then on, rare, on, on some occasions, she would say, okay, you guys just need to sit on the front porch until dad gets home, grandpa gets home. And this had to be music to my mother and my aunt and uncle's ears because when grandpa got, got home, uh, it was much less than what other wrath was stored up in Betty. But he sacrificed for his family. As the years went by and the kids were gone and grandkids and even great grandkiddos were entering the picture, right, Ralph continued to sacrifice for his family. He didn't have a lot of money, but if somebody needed money and he had it in his pocket, it was yours. Shelby and I were blessed to be able to live in their, their basement when we moved back from the Cincinnati area. He sacrificed for his family. And when grandma was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, sacrificing kicked into high gear because Ralph, grandpa, was committed to taking care of Betty for as long as he possibly could to the detriment of his own health. And he, he, he kept her in the home and he, he did what he could to care for her for as long as he could because a lot of times grandma would want to go home. And what she meant is where she grew up. So grandpa very graciously and lovingly, lovingly would take the bags, put them in the car, and they would head home. They would just drive around for a little bit. And when, when she was appeased, they would come back home and unpack the bags. And he did this for as long as he possibly could, sacrificing his own physical health to do so. Love initiates. True love sacrifices. And true love stays. I would bet a year's wages on the fact that the, on the, the fact that I don't imagine that leaving ever crossed his mind because he was committed to the relationship whether that was the exciting parts or whether it was the the physically draining parts, he stayed. And there's a picture, there's a definition of true love. It initiates, it sacrifices, and it stays. And wouldn't we all love to have somebody love us like this, to this degree, Wouldn't we all, don't we all strive for this? Don't we want this? Don't we look for it? Husbands and wives in the room today, strive to be this to your spouse. Strive to love in a way that doesn't need somebody to kickstart you, that you start on your own, that you lay aside what you want, even what you need for the good of somebody else, and stay. Don't let separation even become a part of your vocabulary. For those of you who are maybe inching close to marriage, 
commit to being this to your up and coming spouse. Take the initiative, sacrifice for the good of that person and stick to it no matter what. If you're dating, if you're in college, if you're in high school, if you're just getting ready, let this be your standard. Be this for the person that you're going to marry and look for this in the person that God's gonna bring your way. Let this be your standard. Some of us are lucky to have this type of relationship, true love on this planet in this lifetime. But the truth is that all of us have at least one relationship like this. You see, because not only is this just a good definition of true love, it's a biblical definition of true love. And because nestled in 1 John chapter 4, there is this phrase, God is love. And because of that, 1 John chapter 4, this definition gives us a good picture of who God is. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to open it up and to turn to 1 John chapter 4. We've already read some of this, but it's worth reading again. So we're going to start in verse number 7. John writes these words for our benefit. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has, ha- has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because he is, so also we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he loved, He first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he sees, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Here is a picture of who God is, of what love is. Because as we see in in verses 9 and 10, God initiates. God is the one who sent his son. Sounds a whole lot like that verse that we've known since we were little kids in Awana or at Sunday school or in VBS, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent. He sent his son. God initiates. And God also sacrifices this big, long, churchy word, propitiation is the Greek word halosimos. It was a pagan word used to describe what would happen in a local town when a local family would bring some type of an offering to offer to the local deity, lowercase g. And the purpose of bringing the sacrifice was uh, to, to cover over anything he might have done wrong, but also to turn the favor of that local god toward the person offering the sacrifice in a favorable manner. 
It was to garner the love of that lowercase g, God. Well, when this word is used by the apostle, by, by John here, it has to take on a different meaning. Because there is nothing that we can offer God that is powerful enough. There is no work that we can perform that is good enough to make God love us. Why? Because God initiated. He didn't need us, but he chose to create us. When we sinned against him, he chose to forgive us and provide for us. He chooses to love us. We love because God first loved us. There's nothing that we can do to garner his love, to earn his love and acceptance. He loved first. So this idea of propitiation not only means that is this a once every year thing like it was in the Old Testament, no. Jesus came, perfect man, tempted in every way like us, but did not sin. Perfection is what was required to turn the wrath of God away from us and onto somebody else. And he took that wrath for us. So that we never have to, again, travel to Jerusalem with a perfect animal species or or example to cover over our sins for a little bit. No, propitiation means that God offered a sacrifice, that that Jesus offered a sacrifice that appeases God's wrath forever. God initiated all that. God sacrificed for us. And then we see that God stays. In verses 12 and 13 of 1 John chapter 4, we see that. We're reminded of that in Hebrews chapter 13 where God says that God will never leave us or forsake us. He never leaves us. He is with us, not just right beside us, in us. Jesus said in the Gospels, it's better that I physically leave so that the helper can come and live in you. So whether you're sitting here on a comfy seat, whether you're working Monday through Friday, whether you're traveling across the globe, God is with you in that he is in you. He abides in you. In this, we see this amazing picture of the entire Trinity at work in the pursuit of you in a loving relationship. You see God the Father initiating. God so loved that he sent his son God the Father initiates. God the Son sacrifices. Jesus left heaven, came here, lived a life that we couldn't live, died a death that should have been ours. Jesus sacrificed for us. And God the Holy Spirit stays, never leaves you, never forsakes you, is always with you. True love from a true God. And I want you to look at some of the benchmarks, some of the characteristics of this type of true love. If you keep reading a little bit further down in verse 17, you see that this kind of love gives us confidence. Confidence in the day of judgment. If we don't have this kind of loving relationship with the creator, with the redeemer, when we come to judgment, we better be on our knees shaking in our boots. Because what is coming our way is not going to be good. It's going to be judgment and it's going to be exactly what we deserve, which is the pits of hell. If we're not in this relationship of love with the Savior. But because of this love, because of this relationship, we have confidence in the day of judgment. Confidence that we're going to hear, well, good, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into a place of rest. We're going, to have, we're going to be able to stand there in confidence because of that big word, propitiation, where Jesus became sin for us to appease the wrath of our Father. And now all he will do is wrap us in his arms and usher us into eternity in his presence. God sacrifices to give us confidence in the day of judgment. Verse 18 says that true love drives out fear. It enables you to do things that you never thought possible. My grandpa, Westbrook, had no ounce of medical nursing training whatsoever, but he never batted an eye when it came to doing things for his bride of 60 years as she struggled and battled with Alzheimer's and all those implications. It it drives out fear. It enables us to do things that we never thought possible, some of the scariest things possible. 
Now, opening up our mouths and sharing Jesus with somebody who desperately needs to do that. Going places with the gospel. Doing things for our family. And even when we're tired and disinterested and worn out, true love covers over all that and drives it out. We see this clear back in creation. And on every page of scripture, that God has given us creation And he has given us his commands not to restrict us, but to give us this environment in which we can enjoy him to the fullest, enjoy a life to the fullest. And if we are loving this way, our marriages are going to be different. Our workplace is going to be different. Our families are going to be different. Our churches are going to be different. Our communities are going to be different if we choose to live by God's standard and God's definition. And my prayer for us today is that in God, we find the deepest of our heart's desires. Because in actuality and in all honesty, in God alone, are you going to find your heart's deepest desires. You can look for them elsewhere. They may be able to give you some placebo that satisfies you for a bit but it's not going to last. In God, you have the real deal. You have true love. Well, church, we've known this. We've known this with our head for a long, long time. You don't have to have grown up in church to know the words of the song that teach us this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Depending on the version of the song that you're singing, either verse two or three goes like this. Jesus loves me. He who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. God initiated this love relationship with you. He sacrificed to seal that relationship with you. And he stays with you to guide you deeper and deeper into that relationship. I pray that what we know in our head makes that about 12 to 15 inch journey down to our heart. And when we realize it, when we know it in our heart, it will change everything about us especially how we love.